reading. I'm really delighted to announce that we are getting back to our midweek services, the first of which will be our prayer meeting. And I want somebody who knows the time to raise your hands. Have you raised your hand? Raise your hand. 7.30. Rebecca's done very well. (laughs) It's 7.30. And uh, there will be room for you on Tuesday for the prayer meeting. Okay, we'll now have the Bible reading. I hope it's not a random one, otherwise David might have a problem. Oh. Shall we get 
in order here. There we go. So it's um, our reading is from Psalm one or Psalm one. <laughs> <laughs> Psalm 1, and uh, it's from verses 4 to 6. So I will read through from 4 to 6. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the ways of the ungodly shall perish.
Good morning. Ooh. There we go. Good morning. Welcome to Cleveton Family Church. It's good to see you all here. Um, <laughs> I've uh, been having a few um, conversations with people, and it seems as though people last time I was speaking thought I was irreverently calling the prophet Samuel Sam. That is not the case. Um, it's just my accent. It's the proper way to say Sam's. <laughs> so we're going to be looking again at the book of Sam's. And last time we were in Sam 1, and again we're going to be in Sam 1. Last time we discovered the blessed man, and this man was not like the rest of the world. The rest of the world are in constant search for happiness, always searching, but never finding. No, instead, this man, this blessed man, has found joy. That's what blessed means. It means, oh, the joy. This is something that is not dependent on happenings. We also discovered that this man is the shadow of Christ, that he is... Uh, one who has the fullness of joy. And it's only by having a relationship with and following the example of Christ that we can find this joy as well. The blessed man is described as a strong tree planted by rivers of water. He gives forth his fruit in his season. His leaf never withers, and whatever he did prospers. The man who is planted in God will become like this too. But notice in verse 4 how the scenery changes. It says, the ungodly are not so. Suddenly we move from describing the blessed man to the ungodly. We move from blessing to barrenness. The ungodly man stands in stark contrast with the blessed man and shows us the difference between them both. So as we explore verses 4 to 6, what is it that we can learn from the base man? And how can we apply this to our lives to live more like Christ? Well, the psalmist mentions three differences. Difference number one, a difference in description. Verse 4. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. So let's look firstly at what he isn't. The ungodly are not so. This verse would be better rendered. Not so the ungodly, not so. The psalmist is emphasizing a vast difference between the blessed man and the base man. The ungodly are nothing like this blessed man. They are people who take ungodly counsel. They are people who associate themselves with sinners, and they sit in the seat of the scornful. They want nothing to do with God. And we see them every day, don't we? We see them on our, our TVs. We see them on our phones. We hear them on the radio. We bump into them every day. We see them on the TV shows offering advice to people on how to live a life like them. They constantly want us to associate the, ourselves with them. And they seek to offer advice and constantly mock 
and ridicule those things of God. This is the sort of thing that the ungodly get themselves into. This is what they want. It seems to be to them to be great. They say, come out to the club, we'll get absolutely wasted, it'll be great. Come out and, you know, that's exactly what you need is to get your mind off all of this and get completely mortal. I used to work with people like this and I'd say to them, oh, what was your night like last night? They're like, oh, it was absolutely mint, man. <laughs> so I said, oh, how was it? What happened? Like, oh, I can't remember it, but it was, uh, it was proper great, like, I'm like, okay. Sometimes they'd say that it was the worst thing that they've ever done, that they made a mistake, and that they'd never do it again, only to go out that very night. The ungodly are not just those in verse 1 who give bad advice or seek bad advice, keeping the wrong company or scorning the righteous, but they are the opposite of verse 2 as well. They hate God and everything to do with him. They don't read his words, and neither do they want to. For it would only point them to what they already know, that they are guilty before him, that they are unrighteous, and they deserve punishment. Romans 1 says this in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so they are without excuse they suppress the truth in unrighteousness it's like trying to hold down a beach ball underwater and all their reveling, all their mocking, all their scoffing is just trying to suppress that truth because they knew that there is a God. If you're here today and you are not a believer, you already know there's a God. You just don't want to admit it because if you were to admit it, if you were to concede that there is a God, you'd have to release the beach ball, and get a bloody nose. Their delight is not in the law of God. They do not meditate on it day and night. It's all they can do to get the knowledge of God out of their minds. That's why they go to get absolutely plastered. They don't want to think about the things of this world because it's too much for them. Finally, here in verse in, in this part of verse 4 they are not like a strong tree planted by rivers of water they don't want God they hate him and therefore they certainly don't want to be planted in him the ungodly are not so what is it that they are not they are not blessed they seek happiness they try and find it in every little thing that they do but they're always searching and never finding. They're not blessed because they have not found God. But what are they? We've looked at what they aren't, but what, let's look at what they are. Look again at verse 4. Not so the ungodly, not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. In Israel, at the time that the psalmist was writing, the farmers would gather in the wheat harvest. They would have to separate the wheat from the outer casing. I don't know if you know much about wheat, but it has an outer casing. And this outer casing is useless. It's not very good. It's not very tasty, for sure. And so whenever you go to eat it, you want to remove the outer casing. And the way that they would do this is they would cut down the wheat they would go to somewhere that is high up called the threshing floor and they would get all of their wheat on a sheet and they'd throw the wheat up into the air and the wind would come and take the chaff off or the outer casing off the wheat and the weight of the wheat would take it back down 
onto the sheet. And therefore, you have some delicious wheat left to eat without the chaff. You see, the chaff was worthless. It was only fit for burning. It had no roots, and it was weightless. So it couldn't stand up for itself. And so when the wind came, away it went. And so what the psalmist is saying is this. The ungodly, you're not like the strong tree. You're not planted and rooted. Instead, you are like the chaff, worthless, fit only for burning, weightless at the mercy of the wind. We can see the comparison that's being made, isn't, can't we? We can see how the ungodly are at the mercy of the elements that are unseen and uncontrollable. And therefore, we see that while the blessed man resides in the strength and the grace of God, the ungodly goes only in his own strength, which is weak and unable to resist the uncontrollable nature of life. Richard touched on this when he spoke last when he said that life, um, the, the life that we lead is influenced by unseen forces, which can drive people to and fro. But the irony is, is that people don't want to admit that that is what uh, runs their lives. They don't want to admit that these things exist, let alone that they're controlled by them. Our society today is one that would rather rule itself than be ruled. You see, you can go into the street and ask, would you rather be a slave to sin or a slave to God? And most people would say, I'd rather be a slave to my own sin, to myself. And so society has got its wish. Romans 1 again says this in verse 24, therefore God also gave them up to their uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. You see, this is what society wanted. They said, stop trying to rule me. I want to rule myself. I am my own master. I will face the consequences for my own sin. In verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to their vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Their sin has led them down the path to this place where now, there are broken homes, broken marriages, alcoholism, drug abuse, there's war, destruction, murder, serial killers, children literally getting away with murder because, as was said in the 1920s, they weren't raised right. Thieves breaking into houses, claiming against the homeowners because they hurt themselves when they were in the house and getting paid. This is the world that we live in. This is reality. This isn't just some story. This actually happened. God has given it over to themselves. God has said, you want to rule it yourselves? Okay, this is the consequences. And we keep saying, well, maybe if we had better education, maybe if we had better rights, maybe if we um, stopped doing this and that and that, maybe we can create our own dystopia. Maybe we can create our own world that is perfect. But newsflash, we can't. We cannot do this because God has given us over to our sinful ways. The things that we want are not good. You see, they proclaim themselves to be wise but they became fools. It says in Romans 1, 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. We live in a world where people want to say, we're smart, we're clever, we're woke. We understand what's going on. We're awake to the troubles, but they're just fools. Let's go secondly to the differences in determination. Verse five. Last time we looked at how the blessed man became like a tree, but we didn't see the blessed man's end. Well, verse 5 gives us a view to the end of both the blessed man and the base man. And what is it that awaits the ungodly? What does all life add up to? Well, 
there is the judgment. Look at verse 5. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. This verse follows on from the previous. In effect, it's saying the ungodly are weak. They have no substance. They are blown about by every wind, and therefore, when put under the scrutiny of God, they will not stand. In the 1950s, an insurance test was designed to test the strength of structures that the public would walk on every day. In the 1970s, Cleveland's Pier was put to the test. I'm sure you know that Cleveland's Pier did not pass said test. Some say it was because there was a tap left on and therefore it was put under more scrutiny than it needed to. Some say that it was just weak because of years of neglect and erosion. Whatever happened, Cleveland's Pier collapsed. The final two spans fell into the sea and the pier, or the end of the pier, was um, completely split off from Cleveland. The Bible speaks of a judgment called the Great White Throne Judgment, where sinners will be scrutinized upon what they did with Christ. This judgment will only have one outcome, the abject failure of man. The sheer weight of God's judgment, God's examination is too much for man, for any man to stand before. And the chaff like ungodly men will be found out as rebels and as sinners. If you're here today and you haven't trusted Christ, then this is your fate. You will be found guilty before God and condemned to hell. This is the destination of the ungodly. However, if you do trust on Christ, the work that he did on the cross in taking the punishment for your sin, his resurrection from the dead, assuring us that his sacrifice was enough, then you will escape this judgment because he took your judgment upon himself. The great white throne judgment is for unbelievers. Christians, however, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And there, Christ will judge our works that we have done here on earth as Christians. We are told in 1 Corinthians that Christians are building their lives upon the foundation of Christ. And as we're building, we can either use gold, silver, precious stones, wood, stubble, or hay. The judgment seat of Christ reveals by fire what will survive. As believers, this should motivate us to be about our master's business, to be working, building upon the foundation that is Christ. But be warned that not all building materials are good because our work will be tried and only that which is holy and righteous and God glorifying will stand the test. There are some materials that don't burn when tried by fire. So use those. For those that have not trusted in Christ, then your judgment is for your very soul. The ungodly will come to that judgment to find that earth has fled away. Everything that he had for everything that he built up will be gone. The only thing that will matter is the state of his soul. He will be asked one question. What did you do with Christ? Queen Elizabeth I was a great monarch. She ruled over the defense of England by the destruction of the Spanish Armada. She began what became, what became the British Empire, and she made the country wealthy. But what she knew of salvation, only God knows. But these were her last words, and they're quite important for us at the moment. All my possessions for one moment in time. You see, she was rich on this earth, but when she died, she had nothing. The glory that we give ourselves on this earth is not carried through unto the next. The glory that we have now is only fleeting. But we can, if we're Christians, lay our riches in heaven. 
We can be building something there. But here, we leave our, we leave our riches behind while our souls go on ahead. So that's the judgment, but they'll also not be able to stand in the righteous congregation. This is a literary device, and it's the same thing repeated again, but let's look at verse 5. Therefore, the ungodly will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The psalmist is saying the exact same thing, but with different words. He's saying, you can't stand in the judgment. You're chaff-like. You're not, you don't belong there. You won't be able to withstand the scrutiny of God. And now he's saying, you won't be able to stand in the congregation of the righteous either. It's repeated for effect to emphasize the point that the ungodly will not and cannot stand in the judgment. The sinner can stand with the congregation of the righteous, but he will stand out like a sore thumb. The Bible says that the righteous are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And this is the only reason that they can be called righteous. Not so the ungodly. Not so. For they have righteousness as filthy rags. For those who say, I'm good enough, let me tell you that before you find out too late, you aren't. No one is. There is no one righteous, no one good on this earth. Only Christ can make us righteous. So if you, again, if you're here today and you don't know Christ, then we would urge you to come and repent of your sin, come into right standing of God, and begin to know him, whom to know is life eternal. Finally, and very quickly, let's look at the difference in their destination. Verse 6, For the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. There are two destinations, one for the blessed man, one for the ungodly man. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Well, let's look at Matthew 7, 13 to 14. Two ways and two destinations. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because, the narrow, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. So let's look firstly at the destination of the blessed man. The Lord knows the ways of the righteous. The Lord knows the ways of the righteous. This is more than just an awareness. This is to know intimately. He knows it because he himself is righteous. He knows it because when man is righteous, he's leaning on God in order to be righteous. We are not righteous in and of ourselves. We were all once ungodly. Sinners, people who would not be able to stand in the judgment or in the congregation of the righteous until we trusted in Christ. And he gave us his righteousness. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but that's because it is him that made us righteous. And it is the continuous following of him that will make us more righteous. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. How much more blessed are we who know the Lord, for he knows us too. This is a good thing. This is something that we can rejoice in. The Lord knows the ways of the righteous. And if you're in Christ today, then you are righteous. The Lord knows our way. No matter how hard it gets, no matter how uh, dark it may seem, the Lord knows the way. He is our shepherd. And so we can rejoice in him. Let's finally consider the base man. The way of the wicked shall perish. Again, we have the comparison. We have the way of the, the righteous, the Lord knows it. But the way of the wicked 
shall perish. Here we come to the ultimate end of the wicked. The ungodly, the sinner, the wicked man will see how he is at the mercy of his sin. That outside forces and events have driven him into places where he is. And the things that he claims not to believe in control his life. We saw also how because of this, he would not be able to stand the scrutiny of judgment. And now we see that all of this, all of this reveling, all of this pursuit of happiness will only lead him to destruction. The, the Bible says in Proverbs fourteen twelve, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Friends, are you on this way? Are you going a way that seems right? Well, make sure it's the right way. Because if it's not, the end is death. Again, in Matthew seven thirteen, it says, Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Friends, are you on the easy road today? Continuing on the road, looking for happiness any way you can find it. Does it seem right to you? Like this must be the way to live. Look at all these other people who are here with me. Look how broad this road is. It must be leading to heaven. It must be the right way. Friends, it's not. This is not the way to go. For the easy road where everyone seems to be, this road that everyone seems to think is right is the very same road that will lead to destruction. The end of this way is death. Enter in instead at the narrow gate, the one that few have found, for it is that road that leads to salvation. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. What way would you rather live in? We began by comparing the ungodly to the blessed man. We saw how this ungodly man, by what he does and what he does not do, has become weak at the mercy of the elements, the mercy of the change in society, moving from one thing to the other. And we finished by looking at his end. He will not stand up to scrutiny. He will fall. His end is death. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. And this man, these people who live by this way, are on their way to death and to hell. But there is good news. Christ stands in this psalm, offering you a way out. That if you simply trust in him and his death, burial, and resurrection, then you can be saved from this awful mess. It's not by cleaning up your life. It's not by trying to be good. It's by trusting in the one who was. Upon a life that I did not lead, on a death I did not die, upon a life, upon a death, I stake my whole eternity. You can't clean up your own life. You can't tell God to let you in. You must have a relationship with him. And the only way to him is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to Christ today. Be free from your sin and discover the joy that is in him. Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that you uh, have the way of eternal life, that it is you who knows the way of the righteous. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here that is still living uh, as an ungodly person, someone who doesn't know you, that they would come in faith today, that they would look to Christ, that they would look to the death, burial, and resurrection of your Son, and that they would accept this offer of mercy, and they might come and know you today. I pray this in Jesus' name and for your sake and glory. Amen. Should we stand for the blessing?
together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.
please feel free to go outside and, uh, and speak, and then you can take your masks off and smile. God bless.